Awesome. I am completely like, I hear absolutely nothing that's happening in the room unless you speak into one of the microphones. So uh, my normal MO is that you yell questions and stuff back at me and uh, you're gonna have to make sure you have a microphone. It looks like there's a couple in the back that are ready, just so you know, uh, but otherwise, yeah, I'm completely deaf here. Um, so, well, thanks for still having me, even though I'm in Colorado right now. It's uh, my morning and you all are getting ready to wrap up your day of the first day of the conference, right? After the first, um, after the two days of workshops this weekend or Monday and Tuesday, that is losing track of days. Okay, so my talk, garbage in, pearls out. Um, let's see how this goes. Uh, my name is Jason Turner, and if you don't know who I am, co-host of CVP Cast and host of C++ Weekly, it's a YouTube channel. Published a C++ Best Practices book last year, some of the projects that I'm involved in, and I'm a Microsoft MVP since 2015, which is pretty cool. Uh, I do training and contracting and code reviews and that kind of thing, so if you're interested, you can check that out. Now. This is my normal slides. Move to the front. Please interrupt me and ask questions. Of course, um, well, still please interrupt me and ask questions. Although, it looks like the front row is actually full here. So, congratulations. At least that's from what I can see from the camera here. Uh, and if you're kind of curious at all about my training style, it looks kind of like this normally as a lot of interaction. Uh, although, that's going to be a little bit weirder here. Okay, so this talk is some thoughts on how to have fun at work while processing bad data. Basically, um, this is probably the least technical talk I've ever presented. So this is, again, a little bit unusual for me. Um, we'll see how the timing goes on it. Uh, it's ideas on how to have fun at work, basically, and some ideas on data processing. And there's a party, right? Are you in the middle of a party? Is that right? Or you're getting ready to go back to one with a pub quiz as soon as this is over? It's next is the party. Okay, uh, so I won't keep you too long. We'll see how fast we can get through this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I, I, I won't, uh, uh, I won't drag it out. That's for sure. Okay. So a little bit of background. Um, the setting is approximately 2004. It's been a long time. So if you ask specifically detailed questions about this project that I'm going to talk about, it was 17 years ago. I'm probably gonna get some of the details wrong. 17 years is a long time. I was working in a small startup and the scene is that we're developing a distributed digital audio system. MP3 existed, of course, this is 2004. It is not the dark ages. It is not the 80s. It is not even the 90s. We had digital audio, but people still wanted to be able to use their own high-end equipment with our digital distributed audio system that we we're working on. Things like tape decks. Yes, people still use those in 2004. Record players, hey, a high-end audiophile still use those things today. Reel-to-reel -reel is a possibility. CD changers. Now, I don't know what kind of CD changers you've seen or even how many of you are old enough to remember CD changers, but things like this existed where you could have a 200 CD carousel. I actually found pictures of a 450 CD carousel CD changer. Uh, crazy kind of equipment that people wanted to be able to use in their home audio system. So we would have a setup kind of like this. Um, you know, forgive me if this is my first attempt at making diagrams like this, but we've got someone's CD changer or reel-to-reel, -reel, tape deck, whatever have you, and it's connected with RCA inputs. That was pretty much the standard at the time into uh, an audio encoder device. So this little box about this big, and then we had Ethernet with a switch and a series of these touchscreen amplifiers. You could have them throughout the house and they would be synchronized with each other. Any audio playing on the device would be streamed over. And we could, like I said, have multiple synchronized things. So the, the basic plan, this is intended for people with high-end homes. 
where they might have an audio rack at some point in a closet somewhere in their house with a bunch of these change, uh, CD changers and tape decks and whatever, and audio encoder devices. And then throughout the house, they would have these touchscreen devices with built-in amplifiers where they could stream audio to anywhere in the house that they wanted to. I mean, you know, we do this kind of thing with like, what, like little Google devices and whatever these days, right? But this had a little problem in the design. How do you tell that CD player or that tape deck what music you want it to be playing? How do you start it and how do you stop it? We needed to get infrared signals to the device that we wanted to control. Now keep in mind, this is going to be in an audio equipment rack somewhere in the house and the touchscreen device that, you know, it's in your living room or whatever and you're talking a giant home, theoretically. So we needed to get our IR signal from the touchscreen amplifier to the audio encoder and play it back over an air gap to the actual CD changer or whatever on the other end. This is going to involve some embedded development. I have always wanted to do embedded development. They needed someone to volunteer for this project. Who do you think volunteered? Yeah, I volunteered. <clears throat> Surprise twist. I don't know anything about embedded development at this point. Uh, okay, maybe not nothing. I have a general familiarity with hardware, serial protocols, RS-232-like things, and I can kind of read a circuit diagram, kind of. So this brings me to my first point. Have fun at work. Uh, there's probably something that you've always wanted to learn. I'm guessing that there's something that you've wanted to learn that you have not yet invested the time in. It can be fun to get a job at a company that does those things. So even if the job that you get isn't doing the thing that you want to be doing, if you're working at a place that does the things that you want to be doing, you can have the opportunity perhaps to volunteer to do that thing and get the company to pay you to learn that thing you've always wanted to learn. Definitely easier at a small company. This is, like I said, as a startup. At the time, there was, when I volunteered for that, uh, maybe five, four or five people that worked on software and uh, about an equal number that did hardware engineering. So now we get to the next overview of this design. We've got our touchscreen amplifier device. It is an ARM CPU running Linux. This is 2004 single core ARM, 32 bit. I don't remember how much memory it has, but it couldn't have been more than like 128 megs. Uh, with an amplifier, speaker output, and we've got some sort of IR and audio signaling happening over ethernet to a switch and on the audio encoder device. This is my microcontroller. It's a PIC-18F microchip family device with a um, I.O. pin that going to an I.R. emitter, which broadcasts an I.R. signal to the CD changer or whatever device is attached here, with the audio coming back in over RCA and being encoded by this ARM CPU and, you know, goes the other way through the switch. So we've got I.R. going one way and audio going the other way. And, and just to be clear, I was not involved in the audio side of this at all. This was the I.R. was, was what I owned. There's more, of course. How do I know what IR codes I need to transmit to this audio device? Any ideas? Yeah, well, I can't hear you even if you were going to say anything. Um, so <laughs> we had uh, a USB IR receiver here on a PC where we could record these codes and then store them on the device. And then when you press a button on the touchscreen device, it knows what command to press. Pretty straightforward. But this isn't quite good enough. This works for a handful of commands. It works for however many commands you can fit on a touch screen. You saw that 200 CD changer, right? This is a screenshot, an actual screenshot from this project. Uh, although this is the only screenshot I could find on the internet, and this is actually using our own audio server device. This is not using the CD player uh, touch screen interface, but same basic idea. You can fit maybe 
10 buttons on a display like this. It was a pretty low res display. Uh, the actual cover art here is photoshopped in. It's much higher resolution, as you can tell, than the, than the buttons. I don't know how well that's coming across on the screen. And that's a made up album, just so you know that you can't find that. The uh, graphic artist of the company made up the album. <laughs> okay, this is an image that I grabbed from replacementremotecontrols.com. Now, a couple of years ago, I actually, because I got really invested in this project, I ended up with my own like hacked universal remote controls and that kind of thing, because it was so much fun for me at the time. Uh, you're talking at least 20 buttons. And you're also talking about not wanting to have to get up and walk over and touch an actual button on a touch screen, right? You want to be able to point your remote at something, hit the play button, and have it work. So now we end up with our amplifier device, touch screen device, having an IR receiver that's connected to another microcontroller with a serial connection to the ARM CPU bang, bang, around, so that we can then play a command back out the other end of the CD changer. I ended up being responsible for the entire IR process from end to end, including specking some of the hardware. And just raise your hand, have you ever been involved in having to like choose what hardware gets into a device like this at all? I only see like, okay, so those three of you will be able to relate to me when you get questions like, Hey Jason, that microcontroller that you chose cost a dollar eighteen. Can you find a cheaper one? And I'm sitting here going, I have 768 bytes of RAM on my microcontroller. How far down do you want me to go? Um, yeah. So if you ever get involved in specking hardware and something that's being built for mass production, you'll have conversations like this. All right. So we need to talk about. IR protocols and how this IR pass-through system could work. Generally speaking, it's uh, somewhere between 36 and 40 kilohertz carrier frequency. 38 kilohertz is the most common, and it's just a carrier frequency that pulses on and off. So um, I've got on the top of this graph. Now, tell me, is can you actually see these graphs? Is that reasonable-ish on the screen? Okay. So you've got 38 kilohertz pulses of an IR signal coming at you, and then you've got an IR receiver of some sort that just gives you a binary output for whether or not it's receiving a pulse. And it looks something like this. Um, you've got a plastic case around here that filters out the visible light spectrum, so only IR gets in and it doesn't interfere with the, uh, doesn't cause interference with the receiver. VCC is volt, um, sorry, input voltage ground and VSS is the signal coming back out. So you've got your 38 kilohertz carrier frequency being pointed at this lens, and you've just got that wave, um, square wave pulses on and off coming out of the VSS. So again, if you've worked on any project like this, I'm sure you can relate. The hardware that I'm trying to program for doesn't actually exist, right? But I have to come up with some way to work on this. So I'm working with prototyping boards from the manufacturer of the microcontroller with serial cables attached to my development PC. All kinds of things going on. So point number two that I'd like to make is make sure that if you're going to volunteer for something at work because you want to have more fun, uh, volunteer for something that sounds easy. Uh, that's, that's a key, because um, it never is, right? But you need to think that it's going to be easy. That's how you're going to have fun. Uh, it's, it's, I feel like it's a terrible spoiler, um, but it really does help if you're young. I'm looking out in the crowd here. Some of you are younger than me, I'm sure. If you're young, you don't know better yet, so take advantage of this time in your life. <laughs> but volunteer for something that sounds like it's going to be fun, because you'll really learn a lot along the way. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Now, you're, you're young. You started at this job. You're like, I want to learn these things. But now you, it's, it's very easy to get in this trap of like, oh, well, now I can't let them know that I don't actually know what I'm doing. They know that you don't know what you're doing, right? I mean, you just volunteered for something and said, I've never done this before, but I'd like to learn it. So don't be afraid to ask for help. I spent a lot of hours at work and off work because this was fun. Just for the record, I am not one of these people that's going to suggest to you at all that you need to work 60 hours a week or something like this. 
I worked very normal kind of times, but I had fun sitting there in the evening and actually reading the spec sheets of the microcontroller because I wanted to learn more about it. Um, but I also, I had to ask the hardware engineers for help all the time because I had never used, for example, an oscilloscope and I needed to use one to be able to debug issues happening on this project. So um, I always got into work early. I don't know if you're like me. I, I would get in about 6.30 in the morning. I know in Norway at this time, you've still got five hours until the sun comes up if you're at work at 6.30 in the morning. Um, it was at least an hour before anyone else, maybe two hours before most other people got in. Um, the downside to this, if you work the kind of schedule that I did, is when you leave two hours before everyone else, they all look at you like, hey, why is Jason only working six hour days? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I got here before you were awake. Uh, but that's how I preferred to work. So one morning I get in and excitedly I'm, I want to test one of these new prototype boards that's just been delivered to my desk. I load up my software on it and it doesn't work. And those of you who have done some hardware development, I'm sure you've had this experience as well. At this point, I know enough about hardware diagnostics tools that uh, after you know probing with the oscilloscope and such, I realized that the RX and TX lines between my microcontroller and the ARM CPU have been swapped. So RX is connected, the receive is connected to the receive, the transmit's connected to the transmit. That's clearly not going to work. I got verification from one of the hardware engineers. That's what's going on. He tells me to take it down to the prototyping guys who know how to um, cut the traces and set up a bodge. So if you're not familiar with a bodge wire, they, they look something like this. That's uh, that's just, you know, some, some hot glue and some wires. And if you look real closely, you can see like here and here, they've gone in and cut the traces. So you have to have someone who, who knows what they're doing. They go in, they cut the traces, they solder wires over it, and yay, now I've got my transmit and receive lines connected properly. So at this point, my work area has become a real mess. I've never been known for being highly organized. It's one reason why my background is blurred right now, in fact. Um, so <laughs> I've got uh, some sort of CD changer over here. That I think that's actually a VHS player. I'm not sure. And I've got a switch, and I've just got cables running everywhere, pictures of my family. This is the uh, prototypes of the interface that we're working on. But you can look and see one, two, three of those touchscreen devices and a handful of power supplies. And then right here laid out is one of those amplifier boards. The thing is actually going to play the IR signal back out. And if we, I actually manage, these are the only three pictures I have from this company time at all. And it's a little, it'll give you a little 3D tour of my office space here, because why not? I think this is a terminal based IRC client open. Uh, of course, a bowling pin, uh, a comic, I don't know, yogurt, banana, right? Um, and your Linux Penguin. But most importantly, I've got my C in a nutshell, which is an outdated book. I have since gotten rid of that one, unfortunately. And I've got my copy of uh, C++ Programming Language by Bjarne Schuchtoff, which is right there, third edition I've got. Um, and here is the kinds of things that you collect when you work on hardware adjacent things. This is a early prototype version of the board that was so wrong that they didn't even bother prototype um, populating it. So it ended up as decoration in my office. Um, we left out a key piece here though. Uh, the IR, the consumer remote, like I said, you wanna be sitting there on your sofa, point the remote at the touch screen and have this whole process work. Now, of course, interrupt me at any point if you've got any questions about any of this. Well, yeah, so a uh, quick question though. If you were to point a remote at the touch screen, you hit next track, let's say you hit next track. And how long do you wait to see if that track changed before you try pressing next track a second time. One second, is that okay? It's interesting and it turns out that there's like a human perception lag here. It's something like, and again, 17 years, it's something like 100 milliseconds that if you don't get some sort of a response back, then your brain thinks that it's happening slowly. It's, it's a much shorter time frame than you would expect. 
But so I need pretty quickly for the signal to get there and do something to the CD changer so that when it gets that when by the time the audio gets back into that room, the user knows that something happened anyhow. So I spent days, weeks, months, I don't even remember, tightening the response time to get as tight as I could and as low latency as I could on this. But I had a problem. I had devices that no matter how much I tried to tighten this code and get a good response from it, I just could not get a remote to work. I could point it at the touch screen, I could press a button, and it just wouldn't do anything on the other side. I spent hours and hours debugging this, and I finally realized actually at some point that my pass-through system was like only marginally less accurate than if I actually pointed the remote directly at the device. So what was going on? Now we need to talk about remote protocols. Has anyone, just out of curiosity, worked with IR remote protocols? Oh, so this is like totally new to everyone in the room. It's, it was seriously, it was so much fun. Okay, so there's like a whole suite of these known IR protocols that exist. Companies have standardized them. The most popular one is an NEC protocol. There's an NEC and NEC extended. Um, so if I have something like TCL TV, I have a TCL TV upstairs. Um, I think I'm just going to assume that it works on the NEC protocol because most of them do. It has an address, and depending on whether it's NEC or NEC extended, it's got an address and uh, an address low byte and an address high byte because they pretty quickly ran out of address bytes. So you might, you know, have three TVs in a room and plus volume up on one of them and have them all turn volume up even though they're different manufacturers. So they had to, you know, try to make this a little bit more distinctive. So you've got an address and a command, which is generally one or two bytes as well. And that, this is how universal remote controls work. Has anyone ever used a universal remote control? Okay, so you know, you pull up, you open up, the, depending on how new of one you have or what style, maybe you buy the remote control from the store and it comes with a booklet and it gives you a whole list of numbers. And it's like, if you've got a, a TCL TV, then punch in this code and see if it works. It's just looking that up in a database of a bunch of different addresses and bytes. That's all it is. And so you get these pulses that look kind of like this, like a zero bit is like 560 nanoseconds pulse on, 1680 pulse off. A one bit is 560 on, 560 off. And you've got some sort of leader header, like a nine milliseconds of pulse and then a four and a half millisecond gap then you have your address low byte, your address high byte, your 8-bit command, and your 8-bit command inverted. And you'll note that if you're paying attention, each of these things are actually multiples of 560, because this is all, these things have been around since like the 70s, right? Uh, 70s, I think, is maybe it's early 80s when the NEC protocol is uh, standardized. So it says nine milliseconds on, but that's actually like 8,960 microseconds. And so you've got your leader, nine milliseconds on, 4.5 milliseconds off, and then you're just sending a sequence of bits. That's it, it's just data, pretty straightforward. These are the ideal specs, and it's relatively easy to play back with software or hardware control, again, super simple stuff. That was the ideal world. The real world is that I start receiving things like this. Now 560 is supposed to be correct or some multiple of that. And I'm seeing like 511, 1710, 572. Super low quality dodgy remotes is what I'm dealing with. And so by the time I add any error at all in my ability to record and play back these signals, the remote just simply doesn't work anymore. So uh, again, I don't really expect you to be able to read the numbers on this graph, but on the top, I've got the ideal. On the bottom, I've got the real world. And with these bars, you can see like it starts to really get off if they've got um, any error in theirs. So I originally built my IR system to be able to transmit a very simple set of timings. Uh, it was just basically pulse on, pulse off, pulse on, pulse off timings. And I would record those and transmit them over the Ethernet wire, play them back on the other end. For high quality remotes, it worked great. For low quality remotes, just didn't work. 
an aside on how I determined that this was the problem. Go, going back to my desk space here, this is the oscilloscope that I had. This was the cheapest, oldest oscilloscope in the office that no one else wanted, so it lived under my desk. And I would just have to pull that out and somehow clear space on my desk when I needed it. And I was actually probing the IR devices on the remotes, uh, the IR emitter, and trying to figure out what timing is this IR, this remote control actually emitting. So that I figured out like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't fully my problem. I'm also dealing with really low quality devices. So, you know, sometimes having the right tools make all the difference. Like I said, that was the oscilloscope no one cared about. Fast forwarding 17 years, uh, there are these devices from Celia Logic, uh, $399 for an eight channel uh, uh, probe device, logic device, and it can record it 100 million samples per second, way, way more than I need. That's pretty good deal. And then they've got this awesome software where you can do protocol analysis, you record all these things. This would have saved me probably weeks of effort if I had a device like that. And at 399, totally worth it for a company. Or there's the budget option. For $9.89, you can get an eight channel recorder for, uh, let's see, that's uh, 24 megahertz, plenty fast for infrared protocols. And you can even see at the top of the screenshot, you bought this item. In fact, I have it right here on my desk in front of me. And in the United States, that's even with free shipping, $9.89, okay? So um, <laughs> it would have saved me so much time. And then there's open source free software called PulseView. And PulseView already has a database of IR protocols that it knows how to recognize. And you can just record this thing and look at it so easily on a modern, you know, on the UI here. So, you know, look around. There might be a tool out there that can help you get your job done. It probably doesn't cost a ton. Okay, so what do I do? Right now I look at the time to see how quickly I am moving. I'm moving kind of quickly now. Okay, what do we do? What do I do about this? I've got this dodgy remote that I'm pointing it at the screen. And by the time the signal gets out the other end, there's just no chance. It can't control the device. How can I make it better? I started to think about what you might do today, 17 years later. And those of you who are younger, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. I figure what I would do is build a deep learning model of all known IR protocols. Uh, analyze all of my input data to detect to see if there's some sort of similar sequence in that. Apply a super resolution algorithm to enhance the received data, perhaps. Does that sound about right for modern? Is that, did I go too far? Is that about right? I don't know. I haven't messed with any of this stuff. None of that existed when I was working on this project. So I went the old school route. What do we know? Actually, if there's any microphones, Passing, passing around right now. If anyone can say, of everything we've covered so far, what do I know? If I've got a remote, I start receiving a signal, what are the things that I know? Anyone? Oh, no one's gonna volunteer. Where are you paying? Ooh, someone's volunteering. I'm gonna wait and see what happens. Somebody wants to hear some music. Somebody, that's true. Somebody wants to hear some music. You're right. I meant, what do I know about the IR remote that's being pointed at the screen? Okay. I know that I've got some sort of a header, some sort of a leader, right? We had that pulse on and pulse off. And I know that I've got some representation of a bit. There's two different representations. And I've got some number of bits. That's what I know. So I can actually pass over this timing data and try to detect these components. So in the worst case scenario, I receive a bunch of data, I pass over it, I can't detect anything. There's nothing that's clearly a leader, there's clearly a nothing that stands out as bits or a protocol of any kind. I just fall back to what I've been doing this whole time. I just play back the same thing that I received on the other end. 
The second best case scenario is that I can actually build an on-the-fly protocol. I can detect, oh, there was a leader pulse and then a gap, okay. And then I can detect the approximate timing of the bits. I can build timing buckets and I can build an on-the-fly IR protocol, just make one up. So if I receive all these dodgy numbers, like I was just talking about a moment ago, then I can start grouping these into pulses. And I can say, well, I've got 2,200 microseconds on, uh, 2,200 microseconds total here, 1,100 microseconds, 22, 1,100. And I can do a pass over this and say, well, the first thing, I don't know anything yet, I'm gonna call that bucket zero. The second thing, well, that's greater than 20% or 30% or whatever I'm gonna say is out of spec here, then that's gotta be in a new bucket. And then the next timing, well, that, that looks an awful lot like it's in bucket zero again. And I can build up buckets and just start generating and say, hey, it looks like I just received 32 bits of data here. And then I can average these timings together and generate a protocol. And I can actually tell the device on the other end, I want you to play, you know, here's a zero, it looks like this. Here's a one that looks like this. And I want you to just play these four bits or these 32 bits or whatever. And my choice of zero and one is completely arbitrary. It might be exactly the opposite of what the hardware manufacturer intended, but it doesn't matter, right? All I care is that I'm playing back the timings that I expected. So with this on the fly protocol generation, I'm able to get a little bit like this. So the top one is the ideal, the middle is the real world, and then the third one is the on the fly average protocol. And I'm actually starting to like pull reality back towards the ideal here. And this works, it gets better. I'm able to control more devices now. But that's not the best case scenario. The best case scenario is that uh, after I've dynamically constructed this protocol, um, which worked fairly well, uh, I want, well, I want to get to perfect. Okay, do we think I can get to perfect? You think we can get to perfect? Okay. We can enhance that, okay? <clears throat> I love these. Okay. This is the kind of thing that, in my opinion, feels like it shouldn't have been possible, but it worked out. If I'm able to say that this dynamically created protocol that I just made looks awfully close to the protocol that I know that the device on the other end uses, then I win. I'm able to interpret it using, you know, higher level code. And then on the other end, just say, play back the protocol I know that you were trying to send me with these bits. And I don't have to transmit the timing info at all, only the data and the protocol in this case. And when I do this, I can actually get to perfect. So I can interpret the data and then play it back how it was supposed to be sent to me in the first place. Assuming the margin of error here doesn't get too big. And then I end up with my bottom timing here, my output being perfect. It's being exactly the same as the ideal world. I actually created at this point a pass-through IR system that often worked better than pointing the remote directly at the CD player. I was pretty proud of that. So garbage in, pearls out. That's the idea here. This is the whole layout of the system at this point. And I've got my consumer remote, I point it at an IR receiver. It's got a um, interrupt driven IO pin on my microcontroller. This code is written in C. I'm stuffing all these timings into a local buffer which like I said, is probably only like on, on this device, like one and a half K or something like that. And then I transmit that over a serial protocol to the physically connected ARM CPU where it stores it all in a buffer. And then I run it all through my IR processor and over ethernet it goes to the serial buffer on the other end, which then using a serial protocol goes back into an IR buffer on the output side, which has a, um, pin that's just constantly being driven at 38 kilohertz that I gate off and on to an external IR emitter, which sends the command to the CD changer, and that changes the output, which comes all the way back around and different sound comes out the speakers. And it worked. And 
Now, remember when I said volunteer for something that sounds easy? This <laughs> definitely did not end up being easy, but it was a lot of fun in the end. That's the whole thing that I just said. Uh, of course, if you've got a microcontroller on the board, you can't have it just do one task, right? So I had to do other things at the same time. I was also tasked with controlling the touchscreen's backlight. That's a whole other story. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of that. But I have, uh, I'll do it at a, at a high level. I've got an A to D input pin on my microcontroller that's just telling me, you know, what's the current analog value of this backlight control? And then I've got a PWM that I need to adjust for the backlight controller. I'm basically creating a voltage that's going into the backlight controller that's then setting the, uh, the actual brightness of the backlight. This was um, before LED backlights were common, so it was one of those microfluorescent tube deals. I had to deal with a, a really noisy A to D input. So uh, if you consider that as you just walked past one of these devices that might be mounted on your wall here, you're going to cast a shadow on it, and I'm going to get vastly different backlight, uh, ambient light values coming in. And then I also had to deal with the fact that there's a little bit of a feedback loop here where if I'm changing my backlight value, that's changing how much light the ambient light sensor is picking up. But basically, you want, you know, if you think about your cell phone, in a very bright room, you want the backlight to be very bright. In a dim room, you want it to be dim. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. It is, in my opinion, completely opposite of intuitive. You're all like, it's dark. I need a brighter light. No, you don't need a brighter light. That'll blind you. You need a dimmer light. Anyhow, when I was working on this, I did it backward at first. So I had to fix it. <laughs> um, this was also before I was, you know, we were all carrying cell phones with auto dimming backlights in their, our pockets. So I, I now had to learn something about input data smoothing as well, and something about output control smoothing for usability. My control flow worked something like this. I would read the ambient light value. I had some sort of five or 10 ring value buffer, something like that, value ring buffer. Take the average of all those values, and then I would say, OK, what is my new expected back backlight value? And if my new expected backlight value was greater than my current value, then I incremented my backlight value by one. It took a while to get there, you know, at most by one. I was thinking, oh, well, I'll just immediately set it to the expected value. No, don't do that, because then you walk past the device and the screen just starts flickering, right? So uh, I'm basically constantly setting a vector. Am I wanting to go this way? Am I wanting to go this way? Or am I wanting to stay the same? And just constantly driving towards that value uh, that I want to be my expected, my, my, my new current value. It was a, a very simple um, process. But it ended up with, you know, if you turned the lights off in the room and you had multiple of these devices in there, you could kind of watch them all slowly dim down to an appropriate value. So my point number four here, just work with whatever information you have. Uh, there's probably something in your domain data or protocol that you can use to increase the quality of your captured data. There's probably some way you can do this. And this brings me to a note about testing here. Um, This organization that I was working for at the time, we did not have a culture of automated testing at all. And in the last 17 years, as I've gotten more and more in the world of, you know, you should test your code, uh, which I, I do highly recommend, right? Um, all of these things were hand tested on my desk. So if you, like, this is not an IR remote, but I keep pretending like it is when I'm pointing it at the screen. Um, but there's a surprising amount of IR that can bleed through. I actually found some devices where I could put my hand completely over the IR sensor on the CD player and put the remote here and hit play, and it would still control the, the CD changer. And the hardware engineers, I would tell them this, and they're like, no, that's not possible. And I'm like, well, come to my office and look, right? Um, so, you know, this stuff was just all on my desk with my hand, like, covering things and pressing buttons to see and measuring timings by hand. 
I still have yet to come up with, that, that's clearly that was not the best solution, but I've yet to come up with what would be the ideal solution for doing automated testing of a setup like this. Um, I don't know, you would have to take one of these low quality remotes and like hack it so that you could electronically press buttons on it in a deterministic way and, you know, take out its battery and feed that hardwired that in and have things that could record timing data on both sides and compare it all together. I don't know. Um, so I, I, I did want you to come up to me and talk to me after the talk if you had a good idea for how you would fully test a system like this, but you can't do that in this environment. So talk to each other about this while you're drinking later tonight. But while preparing for this talk and another talk at the same time, I ended up needing a really good high quality bitmap scaling algorithm that had to work in pure black and white images, had to smooth edges, which means nearest neighbor is out. It doesn't smooth. And any traditional smoothing scaling algorithm is out because they all expect to be able to have more than just black and white. They expect these things called, you know, colors in between those. So I asked Twitter, and it turns out there's an entire category of algorithms for scaling pixel art. I didn't know this was a thing. And some of them produce almost unbelievable results. So this is from Depixelizing Pixel Art from SIGGRAPH 2011. On the left is the nearest neighbor scaled result, and on the right is their basically vector art result. Uh, and to me, this is absolutely mind-blowing. Then there's the relatively well-known family of HQ whatever X, HQ234 X scaling algorithms that are used by emulators. So if you're playing like an NES emulator, it almost certainly has one of the algorithms in this family. And the input on the left, again, nearest neighbor, this is a 3X result. And you can see the jagged edges and such when on the right we get the smoothed corners and you know the smileys got like a circle around it pretty much and that kind of thing. Pretty amazing results. This is the Wikipedia entry which I find to be almost completely impenetrable. Um, the color of each of the eight pixels around the source pixels compared to the color of the source pixel. Shapes are detected by checking for pixels of similar color according to a threshold. That gives a total of 256 combinations of similar or dissimilar neighbors. And then to expand that one pixel into its two by three by or four by block of pixels, the arrangement of neighbors is looked up in a predefined table that contains the necessary interpolation patterns. So this is my really poorly done diagram of what this is doing. The green is the pixel that I want to expand. I want to expand this into a two by grid. To do that, I need to take this yellow, which is the entire three by three grid, that's nine pixels in total, but I just determine these eight, are they close or not in color to the center one? And that just gives me simply an eight bit value. And then I look that eight bit value up into a table of 256 possibilities and go bam, copy the result into that two by two grid or three by three grid. So this is an extremely fast scaling algorithm that works remarkably well for one very specific type of data. Um, you, so I, I use this HQX as an inspiration. I was able to create a small, fast, custom scaling algorithm. It did exactly what I needed. That talk is called uh, Your New Mental Model for Const Expert. I am giving that at CPPCon in on Monday. So attend CPPCon to hear that talk. Actually, you can attend CPPCon and hear that talk because that talk will be streamed. So if you have one of the remote tickets for CPPCon, then you'll, you'll be able to also attend that talk. So point five, uh, get inspiration from others. It's probable that the problem you're trying to solve is, is it's not completely unique. Let me rephrase. It's highly unlikely that the problem you're trying to solve is completely unique. There's probably someone who has done something adjacent to what you're doing right now. You can go and look at research that other people have done, get inspiration from their solutions, and you can probably get something that'll inspire you for yours. So my summary here, um, have fun at work, 
make sure you volunteer for something that sounds easy and remember the key is fun and it helps if you're young um, but and either way uh, do that it's fun be sure you ask for help and keep learning and work with whatever information you have available to you and get inspiration from others because there's almost guarantee that someone else is working on a similar problem. So that's who I am and if there's any other questions uh, or any questions at all you can go ahead and pass the mics around now and we've got a few minutes otherwise you can commence your partying. The mics are right behind you. Oh that's cool I heard the clapping it's like it just broached the threshold or something. Questions? No, I think that's it then. They're all ready to drink. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>